Hi there, I'm Zach, and in this video I'll be explaining how to apply the principles of editing to films of your own creation. In this section, we'll be looking at the assembly of your footage. First, we look at the joining of images. What this means is the way you put together footage that you've taken, and ultimately joining images is the very basis of editing. What you should consider when making a film is that to a degree the viewers will be suspending their disbelief. You have to make sure that it is possible for them to do this, and what that means is putting the footage together in such a way that the film makes sense. This allows the viewers to become part of what they're watching, and if at any time it does not make sense, they're snatched out of your creation into reality again, and the effect is broken. You can see that joining images correctly is very important to editing. Cutaways are used to give the viewer visual information about something. Normally they are used to help explain something that a character is talking about, so the visualisation of the topic helps us to understand it. The cutaway scene can be set in the past, present, or even the future, though the latter is not very common. Normally there is dialogue over a piece of cutaway footage, but this isn't essential. When the cutaway finishes, no time has passed other than that of the spoken dialogue, if there is any. Cutaways are used commonly and effectively for a storytelling technique, and in fact they're being used frequently in this video. Keep an eye out for them. A cutaway can be spotted immediately when a voice is talking, but you can't see the speaker. Instead, you see something that he or she is talking about. Take a look at this scene from Shaun of the Dead to get an understanding of how cutaways can be used to provide the viewer with visual information about something. Where's safe? Where's familiar? Where can I smoke? Take calm, go to Mum's, kill Phil, sorry, grab Liz, go to the Winchester, have a nice cold pint, and wait for all this to blow over. How's that for a slice of fried gold? Yeah, boy! The very first rule of a transition is to only use one when suggesting that time has passed. There are certain guidelines on which transitions are good and which are, well, not so good. First let's look at transitions that are okay. First we have the straight cut. Now this is very common. It came about from French New Wave films which were low budget. Flashy transitions were expensive to be edited, so straight cuts were used instead. They are normally used between clips of the same scene, as they do not indicate any passing of time. Now let's look at the dissolve. This is also very common. It normally indicates that time has passed, be it a long or short amount. Then there's the dip to black or white. This is used occasionally to suggest that time is about to pass. It normally indicates the end of something. For example, there might be a dip to black to show a person falling asleep, or a dip to black before the next morning is shown in a film, and so on. The dip to white might indicate flashbacks or losing consciousness, as this example from Harry Potter demonstrates. Now the wipe. Although not very common, this is still an acceptable transition. It indicates the movement from one place to another, and therefore the passing of time. So those were a few examples of transitions that work well. Now let's look at a few that are not okay. For example, diamond in or out, swing in or out, checker in or out, and spiral in or out. All of these are very uncommon. They don't often look good unless applied in the right way, to the right scene, at the right time. They are very difficult to do effectively, and all of them indicate the passing of time in a loud, obvious way. Think back to when you were producing your first ever PowerPoint presentation. Did you throw in every effect in colour and font you could think of? If you ever look back at that now, you'd be horrified. So, you may be wondering why I've labelled certain transitions as okay and others as not okay. 
Well, this is because transitions should never really be noticed by the viewer. Transitions like the last few are uncommon and tacky. They are too obvious and we are distracted by them. Also, because they are noticed by the viewer, they seem quite unprofessional and give the impression that they would be very easy to edit. This is not impressive at all. There are always exceptions to the rule though. Transitions like the last few could be applied, for example, quite effectively in a slapstick comedy movie. Eyeline match is a method of joining images that suggests a connection between different things. For example, imagine footage of a woman looking towards the ground with a horrified expression on her face. Then the film cuts to an image of a mouse scurrying along the floor, and now we understand why the woman is looking horrified. She has seen the mouse on the floor. But why do we make this connection? The camera does not pan from the woman to the mouse in the same clip, so how do we know that the images are even associated? We make the assumption in our minds because of the eyeline match. The woman is looking down at something in the clip, and then we see a shot of a mouse on the floor. And jumping between these images creates a connection between where she is looking and what we see in the next shot. Now imagine again the same clip of the horrified woman looking down, but replace the second image with a shot of an aeroplane coming through the air towards the camera. Now this doesn't make sense. Why would the woman be looking down only for the object of her sight to be apparently very high up? It disrupts the reality of the film and confuses the viewer. Always make sure that you use eyeline match correctly or your film will not make sense. Arranging the order of events is essential for viewers to understand the plot of your film. Hitchcock provides an excellent example of why arranging the order of events is so important. Now the third way is what one might call pure cinematics, the assembly of, of film, and how it can be changed to create a different idea. Now we have a close-up. Let me show what he sees. Let's assume he saw a woman holding a baby in her arms. Now we cut back to his reaction to what he sees. And he smiles. Now what is he as a character? He's a kindly man. He's sympathetic. Now, let's take the middle piece of film away, the woman with the child. But leave his two pieces of film as they were. Now we'll put in uh, a piece of film of a girl in a bikini. He looks, girl in a bikini, he smiles. What is he now? The dirty old man. He's no longer the benign gentleman who loves babies. That's the difference. That's what film can do for you. So as you can see, you can use the order of events to tell the story exactly how you want it, and even twist the viewer's emotions as you go. Alfred Hitchcock gives the definition of montage to be the assembly of pieces of film which, moved in rapid succession before the eye, create an idea. Soviet montage is a technique of joining images that suggests an idea to the viewer. The point is entirely this. To suggest. As is obvious, many things cannot be filmed actually happening. For example, somebody getting stabbed. So we have to improvise, and one of the ways we do this is through the use of Soviet montage. Let's use that most famous of examples, the shower scene from Hitchcock's Psycho. See how the clips jump around without actually showing the woman being stabbed? First we see a clip of the knife, then a scared face, then the knife slashing through the air, then an expression of pain on the face. The stabbing is not real, but rather we are led to believe that it has happened through the use of Soviet montage. Our imagination fills in all the details for us. In this section, 
we'll be discussing how the pace of a film can affect how the viewer reacts to it. In music, tempo can be defined as a regular beat or rhythm, and the speed of the tempo often decides what type of song it is. A slow tempo might be a piece of classical music, for example, while a faster tempo might be something dubstep. This same generalisation applies to filmmaking. So, when you are deciding what tempo you want to make a scene of your film, you might start by considering the genre of the scene. Always pause to think carefully. Are you creating a romantic film or an action movie? Romances would have long, slow and deliberate shots of things being peaceful, which results in a calm and gentle feeling. Action films would not work with this pace of footage. They have to be much quicker and therefore include many more clips. This is done in order to force us to take in a lot of information all at once. It causes a physical reaction in us. For example, more often than not, we experience a raised heartbeat during a fast tempo scene. This quick pace makes us feel more tense and involved with the film, which is why we enjoy it. You'll find that shot length is key to finding the correct tempo of a scene. Just take a look at this clip from the Bond movie Quantum of Solace to get an understanding of how shot length can be used to affect the tempo of a scene. As you can see, almost every clip of footage lasts for less than a second. And what does this create? A very fast tempo with heightened drama. So, now that we know that shorter clips result in a faster tempo, let's look at Brief Encounter to see how longer clips result in a slower tempo. I shivered, and Alec put his arm around me. Cold? No, not really. Happy? No, not really. I know exactly what you're going to say. That it isn't worth it. That the furtiveness and lying outweigh the happiness we might have together. Isn't that it? Something like that. I want to ask you something, just to reassure myself. What is it? It is true for you, isn't it? This overwhelming feeling we have for each other, it's as true for you as it is for me, isn't it? It's true. Notice how this is just one long piece of film? It results in a very slow tempo, so physically the viewers are more relaxed as they watch the scene. Clearly, shot length is a massive contributor to the effective pacing of your film. Don't rush ahead early though, timing is important too. Now we know that shot length controls the tempo of the scene, but don't go forgetting that what you put in the clip is important too. The correct timing of shots allows you to focus greatly on one clip, which would be a long clip, and perhaps paying not so much attention to another, which would be a short clip. Let's take another look at Quantum of Solace. Notice how, even though they are still very short, the longest clips are the ones of James Bond, the cars, and the bad guys. This is because these three things are the main focus of attention in this scene. We get the main gist of the plot by watching clips like these. There are actually an enormous amount of other, very short clips, but we don't pay very much attention to them because they're so short. However, this doesn't mean they're pointless. They fill in the gaps in the plot of the scene so that we can better understand what's happening. But. Since we don't need to take a lot of time to watch the gear stick being changed, the shot is shorter and the plot races on. That's how you can use timing to effectively decide on shot length. Cutting to music is a very effective way of using sound to our advantage in film editing. Let's say that your film involves a scene featuring a momentous event. Aside from visual effects such as zoom, how can we add even more drama to a momentous event? Well, we use the sound of course. Let's use our old example of the psycho shower scene. Can you notice how, when the knife is repeatedly slashing through the air, the music supports this action with frequent high-pitched violin strokes? Let's take another example. 
Listen to the audio in this clip from Star Wars. No, I am the father. Did you notice how the renowned theme tune cut in at exactly the same time as the momentous event? It supports what has just occurred with uncommonly loud, bold noises and adds drama to what we are seeing. So now you understand why cutting to music can be very useful in the pacing of your film. It's all about adding drama and excitement. In this final section, we'll be looking more at preparation for film editing. It's called creating film space. When filming, you should always be aware of the space that you're in. For example, where are the people positioned in the space? Let's imagine a triangle of three people having a conversation. Having one camera aimed at all three people at once would be inefficient because we wouldn't be able to see at least one person's face throughout the entire conversation. This is why we change the camera angles around. By using two or three different angles, like over the shoulder shots, we allow the viewer to see all of the different people in the conversation. But what you have to be aware of most of all when filming with multiple camera angles is where the people are in the shot. If we know where the people are, then we can make the filming much easier for ourselves. Let's imagine that two of the three actors standing in a triangle are ill on one of the days that the particular scene is being shot. With the use of over-the-shoulder shots, we could provide body doubles to stand in the same space as the other two actors normally do, and pretend to be their character. As long as they look the same from behind, the viewer wouldn't know the difference, because they are standing in the same space. When filming a conversation between two people, the shot-reverse shot is the most common method. This is because it shows the viewer the expressions of both the people. It includes them in the two-sidedness of the conversation and helps them to understand what the conversation is about. The face of one person is shown in an over-the-shoulder shot of the other person and then vice versa. The shot-reverse shot is also used commonly in interviews and in fact, it leads on nicely to another important aspect of film space. The 180 degree rule is a way of editing using space that allows our brains to make sense of what we're seeing. When filming a shot reverse shot of a conversation using over the shoulder shots, the camera needs to stay on one side of the two people the whole time. This video demonstrates perfectly how to use the 180 degree rule in editing. The first rule we can look at is the 180 degree rule. Once you establish a scene and show where people are, you've also established the 180 degree rule. From this master shot, we've established that the woman is on the right and the man is on the left. That means that whenever we show them, he should be on the left and she should be on the right side. From the overhead, we can show that as soon as we place them for the camera, the placement of the camera can only go anywhere on this side of the line, meaning 180 degrees on this line. We can aim the camera in any direction, but it must be on this side of the line. Now, even though from overhead we can clearly see where the actors are, it's not as clear from what the camera sees. If we break the 180 degree rule and place one camera here and the other camera over here, the camera view shows the actors facing the same direction. Even when the angles are not as blatantly off, it can be disorienting because the actors' eye lines won't match. Now, you can cross the 180 degree line, but you have to show the camera move, like so. Not only do you have to shoot this movement of crossing the line, but you also have to use it in the edit. That way you orient the viewer. Once you're on the other side of the line, you have to stay on it, unless you move the camera back to the other side. If the 180 degree rule is not followed, the viewers will not believe the scenario.
continuity editing is, in a way, invisible editing, because you don't see it happen if it's done well enough. In cinema, special attention must be paid to continuity, because films are rarely shot in the order in which they are presented. Imagine a clip of a man wearing a sun hat as he does some gardening. The clip changes to a close-up of some gardening tool or other, and then returns to the man. But suddenly, he is no longer wearing the hat. What you didn't see is, off-camera, he stops his work, takes off his hat for a few moments and scratches his head. He then forgets to put the hat back on when they resume filming, and nobody notices until they watch the footage later on. It is only then that they realise that the man's hat has remarkably disappeared without a trace, with no sign of him realising his disappearance. This is called a continuity error. Continuity editing is all about making sure that situations like this don't happen when filming. While most continuity errors are subtle, such as changes in the level of a drink in a character's glass, or the length of a cigarette, others can be more noticeable, such as drastic changes in the appearance of a character. Such errors in continuity can ruin the illusion of realism and affect the viewer's suspension of disbelief. It removes them from your fabricated reality and the effect is ruined. So you must always keep an eye out for potential continuity errors when filming. And yes, my earring and necklace did just miraculously appear. Good continuity error spotting. Thank you for watching this video about applying the main principles of editing. Happy filmmaking!